Released in 2013, Risk of Rain was developer Hopu Games' first foray into the world of game development. Taking place on an alien planet known as Petrichor 5 that an interstellar transport vessel, the UES Contact Light, crashed onto, the story follows the lone survivor of the crash trying to escape from the hostile environment they found themselves in. With its fun gameplay loop made up of roguelike elements and a unique escalating difficulty mechanic, the game was well received. And a few years later, with the help of their community, Hopu Games developed a second game in the series which follows the story of the members of a rescue ship that is sent to the UES Contact Light's last coordinates to try and find out what happened to the missing ship. While the premise is laid out at the start of each game, the rest of their stories aren't told through cutscenes or through dialogue between the characters, but through item, monster, and environment logs that the survivors slash rescuers find on the planet which detail various aspects of the world. Things like showing what the survivors of the contact flight went through after crashing on the planet, describing the creatures of the planet and where they've come from, and revealing the past of Petrichor V. The sheer number of these logs, combined with the fact that some are randomly dropped by certain creatures, some of which may never show up in a run, means that most players, even the ones that want to figure things out themselves, will likely never have everything they need at their disposal to see the history of the planet in full. So let's take the time to gather all the relevant data, put it all together, and present it here so that we can see the full picture of Petrichor V, from its mysterious past to the world that we see now in Risk of Rain 1 and 2. Obviously, there's going to be spoilers for the stories of Risk and Rain 1 and 2 in this video, so if you want to try and piece things together yourself, now's the time to click away. Additionally, I need to mention that as of the writing of this video, the story of Risk of Rain 2 is still currently being added to, with new content being released for the game fairly frequently. This new content is sure to add new information to the story, so as this video ages, some of it may be out of date. Just keep that in mind if you're watching this a few years down the line and some things are missing or don't add up. But with all of that out of the way, let's get started. The story starts with two brothers, Providence and Mithrix. Young members of a Cyclopean alien race, the two lived amongst others of their kind somewhere in the cosmos. While they were free to play and frolic like the other children of their society, they also had a rule to avoid playing with the gravity wells as they were very dangerous. A fair warning, but as is common with children, a warning that was also tempting and enticing especially to children that are curious. Children like Providence and Mithrix. Occasionally, when the two were bored, they would sneak off to play with the gravity wells, throwing bits of matter like dirt or fruit into the wells to watch the primordial force suck it out of existence. It was good fun, and eventually their experiments progressed to throwing bits of energy, like heat and radiation into the wells to see the same effect. That's where their experiments ended though, as they both agreed to never throw living creatures into the wells, as life was too sacred to be treated like a toy. Or at least that's what Providence thought. When his brother wasn't looking, Mithrix, his lust for answers stronger than the value he placed on life, would throw worms into the wells to see what happened. It was always behind his brother's back though as Mithrix knew that if Providence saw it happen, it would upset him. Well, he was right. One time, and only one time, Providence saw Mithrix throw a worm into the gravity well. The next thing the brothers knew, they were on the surface of the planet known as Petrichor V, likely the result of a struggle that erupted between them that brought them too close to the gravity well. Trapped on their planetary prison, isolated from their kin, the two began the work of trying to find a way to return to their people. Mithrix took to trying to understand the universe around them, 
and eventually, after years of study, he identified the four elements that made up matter in the universe. Mass, design, blood, and soul. Of the four, Mithrix found that design was his favorite. And as his knowledge of the compound deepened, he found that he could use design to create many wonderful and magnificent things. Similarly, his brother Providence found he had an innate ability to manipulate soul, the element associated with life, which was unsurprising considering the love he'd had for life ever since his youth. The two then discovered that the powers they had were actually complementary to each other, as Providence could give life to the constructs designed by Mithrix. Using this combined power, the brothers began to experiment, eventually creating golems of titanic size and strength that could care for and protect them. But as more and more of these guardians were built, a small rift began to emerge between the brothers. Mithrix was satisfied with the work they were doing, but that's because it was all being done his way. It was his designs that came to life the way he had envisioned them, all for the goal he wanted to work towards. Providence, meanwhile, was feeling quite unfulfilled, as the designs Mithrix brought to him had specific ratios of each compound in their makeup that Mithrix said ensured that the guardians they created would remain strong, dependable, and above all, loyal. But Providence felt that these designs didn't have enough soul in them for the constructs to truly come alive. They were just soulless husks or tools to be used and then discarded when they were done. Thus, one day, motivated by his dissatisfaction, Providence created a guardian of his own. Using one of his brother's blueprints as a base, he put the golem together, but gave it much more soul than was originally called for, resulting in a large titan that could feel and think and experience emotions. Just what Providence had hoped for. But when Mithrix caught sight of the Guardian, he didn't take kindly to the changes in his design that led to the Construct's creation. Concerned that the abundance of soul could eventually lead the Titan to turn against them, Mithrix locked the Golem away in one of the vaults slash pocket dimensions the two could create where it was to suffer an eternity, locked away from the universe. He then chastised his brother for creating such a dangerous creature and feeling he could no longer be trusted in their construction, took over the responsibility of building the rest of their guardians, saying that although they would be smaller and weaker, they would at least be loyal. Providence wasn't left with nothing to do, however, as Mithrix had a plan that, if it came to fruition, he believed would be their salvation. Mithrix had been working on the design of something he called a gate, a structure that, when activated, would have the ability to instantly transport something to a partner gate without losing the data of the object transported, meaning it would arrive on the other side intact. And the best part was that this transportation could cover immense distances. He figured that if he and his brother could create some of these gates, then they would be able to use them to escape the planet and eventually return to their home. It took many years of hard work and required them to use the full extent of their powers of design and construction. But eventually, they managed to do it. They built a gate, the primordial teleporter, and successfully transported something without loss to commencement the moon of Petrichor V. Mithrix was ecstatic at the results, but noticed that Providence seemed disappointed in them. Mithrix tried cheering him up, telling him that they could escape their prison now, that if he cared so much about life, he could use the gates to save others of their kind that had found themselves trapped on planets like they did, that with their powers combined, the entire universe was now at their mercy. But still, Providence remained downcast. 
Believing it would help cheer him up, Mithrix pushed him to go through the teleporter, to see the fruits of their labor and be the first to arrive on another world. This finally prompted a reaction from his brother, who insisted that he should be the first one to go through the gate. Still believing it would help his brother, Mithrix acquiesced. He stepped upon the teleporter and warped to commencement. After taking a moment to take in the feeling of this new world, he turned and watched the teleporter, eagerly awaiting his brother's arrival. Back on the surface of Petrichor 5, Providence looked upon the gate with hesitation. Unlike his brother, he wasn't excited about the prospect of leaving the planet because as the years had passed and he spent more and more time on Petrichor 5, he had grown attached to the flora and fauna that thrived there. So much so that leaving the planet now seemed unbearable to him. He didn't share his brother's desire of hopping from world to world, searching for what used to be their home, because to him, Petrichor 5 was home. He knew his brother would never see things that way, that he would never accept the planet as his home, and that he wouldn't leave without him because he was too important to his plans to allow him to stay. Feeling like there was nothing else he could do, Providence made the only choice he felt like he could. He changed the alignment of the primordial teleporter, breaking its communication with its partner on commencement and stranding Mithrix on the moon. Believing that he couldn't reason with him, Providence betrayed his brother just so he didn't need to leave his home and could finally live the way he wanted. Providence got right to work, crafting Petrichor V into a paradise for those that called it home. However, as he was working on his utopia, he knew he didn't want it to only be for the life native to the planet. He wanted to save as many lives as possible. So, using the teleporter designed by his brother, Providence traveled to other planets in the cosmos to find species or civilizations that were on the brink of extinction and saved them by bringing them back to live on the paradise that was Petrichor V. He saved a people made of tar that resided in clay pots from their self-destructive parasitical worship and crafted a desert sanctuary for them that resembled their homeland. He rescued a species of bison that were at risk to be poached to extinction and put them in an environment that was familiar to them. He plucked a reptilian species called the Lemurians from their dying planet so they could burrow new, better tunnels for themselves in the crust of Petrichor V. And he didn't just stop at rehoming these people and beasts to his paradise, he protected them once they were there too. When an incursion of dark, single-eyed creatures called imps attacked Petrichor V, Providence helped fight them off and repel their invasion before any real damage could be done. As a result of his benevolence, the new inhabitants of Petrichor V came to see Providence as a savior. They called him the Bulwark of the Weak, a moniker that reflected his eternal protection of them. To honor him, some of the civilizations rehomed on Petrichor V began building things in reverence to Providence. The Lemurians built a large, elaborate temple filled with guards of Providence's own making. An agricultural species he saved grew a huge, lavish, extravagant garden for their hero, which they populated with masks they brought to life with the bulwark's favorite compound and a fable was spun about the hero that rode upon great worms that would guard all those that found themselves under his protection. However, Providence never noticed these gestures from his adoring public. In fact, the only thing he seemed to pay any attention to was the moon, as he would commonly be seen staring at it, completely mesmerized with its shine. As if he could feel something staring back at him. Indeed, there was. His brother, Mithrix. Mithrix's abandonment had not resulted in his death, but relegated him a king of nothing 
and he watched with contempt as his brother built an empire of his own, distorting everything he'd worked for and accomplished to do so, altering his perfect designs to build inferior constructs, using his gates to bring vermin to the planet, using his guardians to protect them. It made him grow bitter and angry, and he vowed that someday, Providence would pay for his betrayal, and he would get revenge. Mithric started by bringing new designs to life, building an army of his own up on the moon. He also tried to turn Petrichor V's denizens against their protector by sending gifts to its surface. Gifts that gave the bearer a glimpse of the great power they could wield if they swore allegiance to him. Providence, of course, tried to stop his people from falling to his brother's influence, claiming the lunar items were filled with evil and darkness, and purifying any of them that he found on the planet. Outside of destroying the item, he didn't punish anyone that he found bearing one, the sole exception being a set of seemingly innocuous beads that were sometimes found in the communities of Petrichor V. These beads were more than a gift from Mithrix. They were a sign that the owner had sworn fealty to the king of nothing, and was therefore an enemy of Providence and the inhabitants of Petrichor V. Anyone that was found with these beads in their possession were struck down by the otherwise benevolent bulwark of the weak in order to keep his home and the home of his inhabitants safe from the wrath of his spurned brother. However, despite Providence's best efforts, lunar gifts continued to rain down from commencement. And for some of the more curious denizens of the planet, for instance, the creatures that came to be known as scavengers who had an innate desire to collect, continued to gather these items and fall to Mithrix's influence, thereby increasing his number of followers. Eventually, when enough had been gathered, he tasked them with finding the primordial teleporter and returning it to its original alignment so that he could return to the planet and wreak his vengeance. Eventually, one of his twisted scavengers was able to find the teleporter in Sky Meadow, but to Mithrix's dismay, was unable to complete the task it was assigned. This was due to a lock that had been placed upon the teleporter by Providence. A lock that was designed by Mithrix. A lock that could not be opened while his brother lived. Knowing there was nothing more his twisted scavenger could do, Mithrix released it from its task and rewarded its loyalty by offering it a place in one of his vaults where it could be at peace and safe from his coming wrath. Indeed, having another one of his designs be used against him by his brother filled Mithrix with rage and motivated him to become a destroyer of worlds, all to spurn his insolent brother. He started to work on designing a grand gate, one even better than the one he designed previously one that would allow him to travel even greater distances, so he could fulfill his newfound purpose as an angel of death. He even knew which planet he would target first. It was one that his brother had been watching intently, fearing its inhabitants would destroy themselves. A planet of water and dirt. A planet called Earth. Providence first caught a glimpse of its people, beings referred to as Earthlings, when he rescued the Bighorn Bison from a planet in the same system as their home planet. There had been some Earthlings that had established a colony on the planet, and as he looked over more of the system, he found more colonies of Earthlings all over it, from the moons of its gas giants to the rocks of the terrestrial planets of its interior. Indeed, the beings were very capable space travelers, with one organization from their home planet having developed technology that allowed them to spread beyond the limits of their home star system and establish colonies in other ones, like the Primus star system. 
These colonies were not isolated pockets incapable of communication and trade though, as the Earthlings had another organization named UES that was capable of shipping goods between the colonies. Despite having an empire that stretched across the stars, things weren't exactly peaceful for the human beings of Earth. Their home planet had recently been engulfed in a bloody war that was incredibly devastating for its denizens, and colonies on Europa and in Primus had experienced violent rebellions that ousted the ruling class of their societies. While things seemed to have stabilized for the Earthlings as of late, these events had concerned Providence, and he decided to keep a close eye on them. Unfortunately, the attention he paid to them also brought the attention of others. One day, while in the midst of a transport, the massive cargo ship known as the UES Contact Light received a transmission requesting a detour. The request came from a source known only to the captain of the vessel, who did not announce the reason of the detour to any aboard the ship nor did he follow protocol and announce that the UES contact light was slowing down as it approached its new destination, Petrichor 5. While not known with any certainty, it's highly probable that the reason for the change in course was due to a special item that somehow found itself aboard the contact light, one of the teleporters created by Mithrix and Providence. If the ship could find the matching gate somewhere on the planet, which the engineers and archaeologists on board thought was possible, and bring it on board the contact light, then they could study these structures to possibly unlock the secret of teleportation, a technology that had eluded humanity thus far. One that, if it could be found, could unlock the next chapter in human history. However, shortly after arriving in space around Petrichor 5, the contact light got an unexpected visitor. Providence warped aboard through the teleporter in the ship's cargo bay, and now believing that humanity was a danger to the paradise he built, launched an attack on the ship. Over the course of the next few hours, the crew tried putting up a resistance, but recognized that they were no match for the might of Providence and his monsters. To save their lives, they used the ship's escape pods to flee from the doomed vessel. And as their pods rocketed towards the surface of the world below, they watched the vast cargo of a contact light rain down around them as the ship crashed onto the surface of Petrichor V. Despite the devastation of the ship, many of its crew members were able to make it off the contact light with their lives, and once safe on the planet, they established rally points where other survivors of the disaster could gather together and wait for rescue. However, they soon found that their escape was a case of out of the frying pan and into the fire, as nearly as soon as they landed, they were beset upon by the inhabitants of the planet who followed the example their savior had set and attacked these newcomers on sight. Thus, the survivors found themselves trapped on a hostile world, facing constant hardship, danger, and death. And due to their unscheduled and unannounced detour, the hope for rescue was slim to none. All things considered, they were likely to meet their end here on this planet with their ultimate fate never being known to the rest of human society. However, there was one survivor of the contact light that refused to hunker down and simply wait for the end to come to them. As soon as their escape pod crashed upon Petrichor 5, they set out to find the wreckage of the contact light and get enough of it working that they could use it to escape the planet. Of course, like all the other survivors, they were attacked by the monsters of Petrichor 5, and to help ensure their survival in their quest, the survivor took to using the dumped cargo of the contact light to gather weapons to defend themselves from the hostile inhabitants of the planet. This gave them enough strength to be able to survive the seemingly endless onslaught of Lemurians, wisps, and jellyfish that they faced. 
Eventually, as they were exploring their crash site, they came upon one of the teleporters of Providence. They used the gate and found that they were instantly warped to another environment on the planet. While this new environment had more of the dangerous creatures that had been attacking them since they arrived, as well as some new ones, it also had more of the dumped cargo of the contact light, letting them build up their resources and weaponry, and another teleporter, which, of course, led to a new environment which had more monsters, chests, and another teleporter. The survivor continued going through this cycle of teleportation and resource gathering, gaining immense power and strength, until, in the Temple of the Elders of the Lemurians, they found a divine teleporter. When they went through this gate, they found themselves in the wreckage of the contact light. They fought their way to the bridge and found the console that would reactivate the ship and take them home. But as soon as it was activated, Providence appeared and attacked them, determined to end them before they could escape. However, unlike the ambushed crew that was helpless to stop him before, this Earthling had gathered a ton of weapons and arms through their journey through his planet that allowed them to fight back. Despite Providence's powers and speed, despite sending his gilded worms after his combatant, he eventually met his end at the hands of the survivor. With this final obstacle out of the way, the survivor walked back to the console and activated it, launching the remains of the contact light out into space and sending them home. However, as the ship pulled further and further away from the planet's surface, the survivor couldn't help but feel a sinking feeling in their stomach, like they had just made a terrible mistake. With Providence's death, a prophecy foretold by his brother had finally come to fruition, and although not directly by his hand, Mithrix got his revenge. Now that his brother had met his end, the moment that Mithrix had been waiting a millennia for was finally here, and he started to prepare for his return to Petrichor V, to take over the empire that should have been his. While the inhabitants of the planet mourned the loss of their savior, wondering what was going to happen to them now that he was gone, humanity was wondering about a mystery of its own. The sudden disappearance of the UES contact light left them baffled, and as questions rose about what happened to the ship and the crew, so too did questions of the fate of the priceless cargo that was lost alongside them. Cargo that was free to be claimed by anyone that could find it. Although all types of searches were conducted to find the ship, official and unofficial, it was UES that got the first lead when they picked up an SOS signal broadcast by the ship before it went down. Wanting to move quickly but also quietly to recover their lost cargo before it was found by others, the company contacted an old captain that they had worked with in the past and asked him to go on a mission to rescue the crew and cargo of the contact light. But as the captain looked over the paperwork, he recognized that the ship they were assigning him, the Safe Travels, was not a rescue ship, which indicated to him that it likely wasn't the crew that the UES was concerned with, but the cargo, and that this operation was likely more dangerous than it appeared. The fact that the mission was to remain top secret only gave further credence to his theory. The captain, sensing the danger, said he would go only if the ship was stocked with weapons and munitions, and he was given a crew that were experienced fighters. UES, desperate to reacquire their cargo, agreed to the terms, and thus the UES safe travels set off towards the contact light's last known coordinates. After some time, they came upon the spot in uncharted space that the distress beacon was sent from, and observed Petrichor V and its moon commencement in all their glory. 
The captain wasted no time in starting the rescue operation, sending down various shuttles and drop pods to the planet to begin the recovery of cargo and survivors. The cargo was the easy part, as there was debris from the contact light all over the surface of the planet. The search for survivors, though, was less fruitful, as the operatives found no evidence of living humans on the planet. They did meet other living beings, though, the inhabitants of Petrichor 5, who, just as they did to the people of the Contact Light, immediately attacked anyone from the safe travels on site. Despite having weapons and armaments prepared for this outcome, the safe travels suffered heavy casualties in the first 24 hours of their operation. But the captain was not willing to give up so easily and continued to send shuttles and drop pods to the surface of Petrichor 5, even going down himself to ensure the job could get done. As the operation continued, a group of one to four operatives inadvertently followed in the footsteps of the lone survivor of the contact light. While exploring the planet's surface and looting the chests that were dumped from the ship's cargo bay for weapons and items to help in their fight against the planet's inhabitants, they came across one of the teleporters constructed by Providence. They activated the gate and warped to another environment of the planet where they gathered more resources, fought more monsters, some of which were new, found another teleporter, and warped to another environment where they gathered more resources, and so on and so on. However, unlike the journey taken by the survivor of the contact flight, the operatives of the safe travels didn't find the divine teleporter in the Temple of the Elders, but the primordial teleporter used by Mithrix to travel to commencement, and sealed by Providence to prevent his return. Of course, with the death of Providence, the lock that had been placed upon the teleporter was now removed, and the operatives found that they could change the alignment of the gate to point to the moon. Although their mission only called for exploring Petrichor 5, the operatives went through the primordial teleporter and arrived on commencement. As they exited the immense temple that had been the site of their arrival, they came upon the first sign of a way to get back to the safety of the safe travels they'd seen yet. A downed shuttle from the ship that was still operable. However, it was contained within a force field that they couldn't penetrate. Ready to be done with fighting for their lives, the operatives searched the surface of the moon for a way to bring the force field down. Fighting their way through constructs they hadn't seen on the planet's surface as they did so. Eventually, they came upon four strange pillars scattered amongst the broken buildings in the area. Interestingly, each one seemed to be associated with one of the compounds that were said to make up everything in the universe. They charged these pillars, hoping they would take down the force field around the ship, but found that they activated some gravity lifts instead. When they jumped into one of these, they were shot high up into the air and came to land upon the edge of the large arena that had loomed over them since they'd arrived. They passed through the sheer barrier and approached a dark orb in the center of the structure. Suddenly, Mithrix, the king of nothing, appeared from the orb and attacked them. Although the humans had been helpful in his revenge and furthering his plans, now that they'd unlocked the primordial teleporter, thereby giving him a way to return to Petrichor 5, he no longer had a use for them and decided to kill them. However, just like his brother, Mithrix underestimated the resolve of the beings in front of him. And although he bashed them with his mighty hammer and sent his lunar chimeras against them, they were able to beat him back. Thanks to the variety of weapons and arms they'd picked up from the chests of the contact light they'd found on the surface. Recognizing that those items were what was giving his adversaries their power, Mithrix pulled every single one of them from his opponents, intending to wield their weapons against them. But by this point in the battle, he was too weak to put up much of a resistance. 
as the operatives retaliated. They eventually regained possession of their items, and eventually brought the king of nothing to his knees, ending his reign. Incredulous, Mithrix faded away. And as he did, the structural integrity of commencement was compromised, and it began to fall apart. The operatives rushed to the shuttle to make their escape, and while doing so, came across strange crab-like creatures whose attacks seemed more like they were trying to capture them than kill them. When these monsters were killed, they collapsed in a loud implosion that took out anything caught in its radius even other crab creatures. They didn't have any more time to investigate though, so dodged past these monsters to make it to the shuttle. After defending it for long enough for it to start up, they climbed aboard and escaped from commencement with their lives. Just in time too, as shortly after they left, the entire moon was sucked into a gigantic black and purple orb and vanished. As the operatives returned to the UES safe travels, feeling as though they'd found the answers they sought when they first came to Petrichor 5, they couldn't help but feel like there were so many more that were now unanswered. Who sent the UES contact life off course, and why did they do it? How did a teleporter from Petrichor 5 end up in the cargo hold of the ship? What happened to the lone survivor of the contact light? Are they out in space somewhere, hoping to be rescued still? Or have they suffered a different fate? UES seems to have an ulterior motive behind sending the safe travels to Betchcore 5, one they've hidden from the captain and crew. What is it that they're hoping to find on the planet? The teleporters? Or is there something else? In some of his logs, Mithrix mentioned a her that traveled from planet to planet and eventually sacrificed herself for providence. Who was this she? How did he and his brother come to meet her? And why did she sacrifice herself for providence? The implosion that took commencement with it was very reminiscent of the death implosion of the crab creatures, and they only appeared on the moon after Mithrix was defeated. Could they be involved with what happened to commencement? If so, why? With so many questions left over, the crew of the UES Safe Travels knows they will have to return to Petrichor 5 to get the answers they want. And in fact, return trips to the planet have already begun to answer some of the questions they've had, in particular with regards to the strange crab creatures they saw in their escape from commencement. The survivors learn that these creatures are named Void Reavers and come from a plane named the Void. The attacks and implosions that the Void Reavers perform don't really kill a creature or destroy an object, but detain it, a process where the atoms that make up the beings slash object are crystallized and stored in a cell. These cells are transported to the void fields that make up the home plane of the Void Reavers, where they are meant to be stored for the rest of time. Using this method, the Void Reavers had safely detained countless things. Monsters, weapons, machines, people, gods. However, as of late, something seems to be going wrong with their prison as the survivors from the UES safe travels find a tear in space surrounded by dead void reavers that allow them to make their way to the void fields and release some creatures and items detained in some of the cells. Who or what was it that killed these void reavers and opened this portal? Was it someone trying to get in? Or something that got out? The survivors aren't sure, but the account of one prisoner they freed in their excursion, a creature known as Acrid, implies that the Void Reavers may have finally met their match and tried to detain something that they could not control. 
Ultimately, the survivors of the safe travels will have to be vigilant and continue to explore Petrichor 5 to uncover all the mysteries the planet has in store for them. Which brings us to the end of the story of Risk of Rain. It's one of betrayal and tragedy, yet also mystery and secrets that stretches across centuries and possibly even across planes of existence. And judging by some of the questions we have left, there are definitely some big players operating behind the scenes that we have yet to see. Meaning this already intriguing story could become something so much more interesting. As I said before, the story for the game is still being written and added to by the developers. So we'll just have to wait and see what's in store for us in the future. Now, I did my best to put everything in order as best as I could with all of the references of where I got my information included, but I know it can be confusing, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Likewise, if there's anything you'd like to point out, feel free to. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts or things I may have missed. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. So until next time, thank you for watching and see you later.